Welcome. In this brief lecture, we're going to look at using gradient descent to solve least squares problems. We'll begin by explaining the role and importance of iterative algorithms in machine learning. We'll then derive a gradient descent algorithm for solving the least squares problem, consider the impact of the step size we choose on the convergence of the algorithm, and then introduce the notion of convex functions which will play an important role in understanding convergence, especially for extensions of the initial approach we're going to look at here. Now, iterative solution methods play a very important role in machine learning. We're going to look at the classic problem of a set of features and labels. So the features are xi, and the labels corresponding to each feature is di, and we have capital N of those. And we'll define our classifier, or our model error, as e squared, be the sum of the squared errors between the prediction of that label using our classifier w and the feature xi and the actual label. We'll add the errors up over all the labels from 1 to n. So we can reformulate this again as a matrix problem where we define a to consist of rows given by the features, d consists of the labels as a vector, and then our squared error is just the two norm of the difference between a, w, and d. In general, we're, in general, we are interested in regularized least squares problems where we try to find the w that minimizes squared error plus a regularization term, where lambda is a tuning parameter and r of w is a regularizer. One example we've looked at so far is ridge regression where r of w is the 2 norm of w. We will look at other regularizers shortly. Now why would we consider an iterative solution method? Well there's multiple reasons that play a role. One is computational cost. It may be computationally prohibitive to try to find the inverse of a transpose a. Another is that for certain regularizers it may be impossible to find a closed form solution but we can find a solution that will iteratively minimize this cost function. And lastly, in some cases, we may be accumulating new features and labels over time and wish to adjust our solution in response to new information. Now the approach we're going to take to find an iterative algorithm is to use gradient descent. That is, to go downhill on our cost function to find the minimum. So let's suppose we have the squared error cost function, f of w, then we could define an iterative algorithm where the new weights w at step k plus 1 are given by the weights at the previous step wk plus a step in the negative gradient direction. So we have minus and tau prime here is greater than 0 and then this is the gradient. So basically what this means is that if we start at some point w sub k what we're going to do is try to find a new iterate wk plus 1 that has a lower value of the cost function. So we'll evaluate the gradient at wk. So we evaluate the gradient at wk and use the gradient to find wk plus 1 by stepping in the negative gradient direction as indicated by the pink arrow here. And if we keep stepping downhill, eventually we should end up at the optimum w opt. So if we consider this in two dimensions. I've drawn these contours which represent levels of constant value for the cost function. So this describes a bowl with the bottom of the bowl being at the red dot and as we go away from the bottom we go up the sides of the bowl. Now the gradient of such a surface is normal to the contours. In other words the gradient is in the direction orthogonal to each contour at a particular point. So let's suppose we start here at the orange point well, the gradient would be the steepest direction. That would point uphill, normal to the contour, because that's the steepest direction. But we're going in the negative gradient direction, so we're going downhill, and then we're going to take some step, tau, in that gradient direction to get our new iterate at this blue point shown here. Well, here we once again measure the gradient at this point, and it directs us in the step that is shown in pink to get to the green point. Then once we get to this point we're going to iterate yet again. We're going to measure the gradient which now is pointing along the axes of these elliptical contours 
and take yet another step. Now one of the things that you notice is as the magnitude of the gradient decreases, we end up taking smaller steps. So the magnitude of the step from one iterate to the next is the product of our step size and the gradient. So when I arrive at this last iterate that I've illustrated here, where I'm at the green point, the steepness of the surface is much less than it was over here, and so I end up taking a smaller step. So we can derive this analytically by noting that our cost function can be written as the transpose of this error vector times itself, and if we expand that out, we obtain w transpose a transpose a w minus 2 w transpose a transpose d plus d transpose d. We can take the gradient of this with respect to w, and that gives us 2 times a transpose a times w minus 2 a transpose d. So we're going to factor out the 2 a transpose and write this as 2a transpose times the quantity 8w minus d. In other words, it's 2a transpose times the error vector at w. So we're going to find our solution for w at step k plus 1 by taking the solution at step k and moving in the negative gradient direction, which I'm going to write here as tau times a transpose times the quantity 8w at the kth iteration minus d. This quantity that we're subtracting off here is exactly what we denoted as tau prime times the gradient. I've absorbed the 2 into tau prime and rewritten that as tau for convenience. This particular algorithm is also known as a Landweber iteration. A geometric insight is very valuable here, and we can see that the convergence behavior depends on tau. So if I choose an appropriate value for tau, I'm going to take steps in the negative gradient direction such that I get closer and closer to the optimum value for w. However, if tau is too big, then I can take a step in the downhill direction. But if I step too far, I can actually end up above where I started with respect to the cost function. So you'll notice this blue point here has higher cost or greater squared error than the orange one that I started at. It's because I took too big of a step. Well, at this point, my surface is even steeper than it was where I started, so my gradient is even larger, and I'm going to step toward the origin, but again, because I've got tau too big, I'm going to end up higher than where I started. And this process continues where you end up oscillating and growing your way up the sides of this bowl-shaped surface to an unstable solution. In other words, you never converge to the optimum for W. So if tau is too small, then it takes many, many iterations because each step is very tiny. On the other hand, if tau is too big, then you never converge and you end up with an unstable solution. So if we put bounds on tau, we can ensure that we will have convergence. Now, the bounds that are relevant here end up being related to the operator norm of the matrix A. Recall that the operator norm is also known as the 2 norm, and it's the largest singular value of the matrix A. The idea of finding a step size that ensures convergence is to make sure that as you iterate with k, you always end up decreasing the value of the cost function. In other words, you always end up closer to the minimum. What you want to do is show that a wk plus 1 minus d, the 2 norm of the error at step k plus 1, is less than the 2 norm of the error at step k. This ensures that you're going downhill or you're decreasing the value of the cost function. Well, in the notes that accompany this lecture, I've shown that you can guarantee convergence, in other words, that you're going to continue stepping downhill, provided you restrict tau to lie between 0 and 2 divided by the operator norm squared of the matrix A. So this ensures that if we start at, say, all zeros for convenience, that's a common place to begin your iteration, and we follow this iterative algorithm where w at step k plus 1 is w at step k minus tau times a transpose times the quantity a w at step k minus d, that as k increases, that's going to converge to the least squared solution a transpose a inverse a transpose d. Now an important question 
is under what conditions does gradient descent find the minimum of our cost function? And it turns out that an attribute called convexity plays a very important role in determining whether gradient descent is going to converge to the global optimum. Now the definition of what it means to be a convex function can be stated in several ways, but one simple way is to say that the second derivative is greater than or equal to zero. And what this ensures is that there are, first of all, no local minima in the cost function, on the right, we have a local minimum, and if we're doing gradient descent, we could easily get trapped in here because whichever side we're on, the gradient points to the bottom of this local minimum. Well, the same thing could happen if you had a flat spot on your cost function that was not at the bottom because that flat spot, the gradient would be zero, and if you ended up there, you would stop iterating. Another way to view convexity is in terms of a line segment test which basically says that if I draw a line segment between any two points on the cost function, in between those points, the cost function has to be less than or equal to that line segment. We can write that mathematically as evaluating the function at some point between a value w1 and w2. We can then draw a line connecting the values of the cost function the cost function itself has to be less than or equal to the line. So let's pick some point w1 and some point w2. So if I draw a line from the value of the cost function f of w1 to f of w2, alpha f of w1 plus 1 minus alpha f of w2 as alpha varies from 0 to 1, I'll get this line. For the function to be convex, the value of our cost function has to be less than or equal to this line for all combinations w1 and w2. Now you can clearly see that this cost function with a local minima is not convex because I can draw a line segment here and our cost function actually rises above the line in this interval. So if a function has a non-negative second derivative, then there's no inflection points, and that eliminates the possibility of the line segment crossing the value of the function. Convex functions are always going to have a single global minimum, and the gradient is always going to point us to that global minimum. Now in the multidimensional case, a similar idea applies in that we can define a second derivative although in this case it's a matrix because it's with respect to each of the coordinate directions called the Hessian matrix, the second derivatives with respect to f in the various coordinate directions. And this Hessian matrix needs to be positive semi-definite for the cost function to be convex. It's easy to test the squared error that we've been working with so far because if you take the second derivative of the quadratic cost function involving w transpose a transpose a w, the second derivative would be a transpose a, and we know that that's positive semi-definite matrix. So gradient descent is going to work for these squared error cost functions. As we go on in this unit, we're going to introduce other types of cost functions that are also convex, and therefore we can use gradient descent to find the global optimum of those cost functions.